Thank you also to Ms. Ambassador for the opportunity to have you here with us, Gabriel. No further delay, Gabriel Steiner from the Black Blocks. Thank you. Is my microphone on? Everything Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming today, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. For those of you unfamiliar, my name is Gabriel Steinhardt, and I'm going to deliver this presentation, which deals with the background and the origins of the product manager role versus the product owner dilemma that software companies that have transitioned into the Agile Scrum software development method are faced with. Before we start, I just want to get a feel for the audience over here. If you could please raise your hand if you're working for a software company that is using Agile Scrum as its primary software development method. That's not a lot of people. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> uh, and if you could please raise your hand if you're currently working for such a company, but you're also a product manager and a product owner at the same time, as you're assuming both responsibilities. So, in order to understand the differences between the product manager role and the product owner role, we first need to understand the underlying disciplines of product management and Agile Scrum from which these roles are derived. So let's start with product management. There's a lot of activity and interest in product management over the last couple of years. There's a lot of people writing blogs, and there's LinkedIn groups with activity, and there are books coming out. And all this activity has created a mass of digital information on product management. But it's also created confusion. People don't understand what is product management, how to define it, where to place it, how to relate to it, where does it belong within the organization. So this in turn had created a situation where literally hundreds of thousands of searches are being done every month on Google by people trying to figure out what is a product manager and what is product management. With such an overwhelming acute uh, lack of knowledge with regard to product management, let's deal with it just a couple of minutes. So we're going to use this example, a very simple example, to illustrate the concept of product management. What we see over here is essentially a toy, a shovel and a bucket, or for the British ones, a spade and a pail. And uh, usually children play with it at the beach. Now, who buys this? Usually who buys, the person, the entity that buys this, are the parents. Now when parents go into a toy shop, they're thinking about such things and concerns with regard to money, safety, they're thinking about will it make the child happy, will it develop their mind, will it keep the child occupied and give me some spare time. They're thinking about a variety of things. So they go and they buy this and they give it to the child. The child is unconcerned with safety and money and development and whatever, the child is only focused on one thing alone. What can they do with this? Can they dig a hole? Can they carry water? Can they build a sand castle with this? So in this very simple example, we learn that there are two entities looking essentially in relating to the product. We have the parents who are the buyer and the child which is the user. The parents, the buyer, they're, considered, they're concerned with one thing which we'll call value. That is, what is the return on investment that we're getting? Are we getting enough goodness or something good of a change in return for the economic sacrifice that we're going to make? And as opposed to that, the child is only focused on one thing only, functionality. What is it that I can do with the product? So we've got the user and the buyer, and companies with a process or a discipline called product planning, they define the functionality that's the, that the product needs to have in order for the user to be able to do whatever they want to do. And they, with an adjacent discipline or process called product marketing, they convey information about the value in the product so that the buyer can make a buying decision. So product planning and product marketing together are called product management. Now we can look at our lives as being divided into problems and solutions. And that red line may appear sometimes and it demarks, it's a demarcation line between the problem space and the solution space. We can say philosophically that there's one big giant problem space in the sky that holds all our political and social and personal problems. And conversely, on the side, there's a space, a philosophical space that holds all the solutions to our problems. The user and the buyer 
are looking at the product to solve their respective problems. The parents bought that toy to solve a certain problem, and the child is using it to solve another respective problem. So that means that the user and the buyer are in the problem space, and conversely, the product and the technology that build the product are in the solution space. Product management deals with the user and the buyer through the product planning and product marketing activity, activities. And therefore, product management resides in the problem space with the user and the buyer. And engineering, and for the sake of our discussion over here, you can also relate to it as product development, is in the solution space. So this little table over here divides the problem space, solution space, and relates to our situation. We've got questions and answers, problems and solutions, market telling and market understanding and market uh, solving or product solving. We have market expertise and product and technical expertise. And this is essentially the difference between product management and product development, two sides of the coin. One owns the problem space and one owns the solution space. So based on all this logic and rationale that we've just outlined, we can say that product management is comprised of two disciplines only, product planning and product marketing, and product management alone resides in the problem space, and it does not reside with the product developers in the solution space, and again, the developers are not with us in product management in the problem space. During the 80s, Microsoft was going through a very bad time. Bill Gates was making a lot of money. 1980 was making millions, 83 multi-millions, 85 billions. But all along that timeline, Microsoft was producing products with a lot of problems. They all had many bugs and they all shipped late. So to make this long story a little short because of our time constraints, Bill Gates uh, reached out into IBM, which was the most formal and ordered company in the world at that time, takes a guy by the name of Mike Maples and tells him, please fix all these processes that we're using at Microsoft to deliver products to market. It takes them some years, and in 1993, they come up with an approach which is called NSF, Microsoft Solutions Framework, which is their perception and perspective on how to build and how to deliver products to market. There are several models over there, and what we see over here is essentially the MSFT model. And let's look at these six entities within the MSF model and understand the relationship and the concept of product management with regard to the other parts. So we've got the developers that in software they write code, the testers, their enemy, and they're always fighting, there's a lot of joke about that. And we've got the people who re release management who are responsible for the logistics and the operational support. And we have something which is called user experience, which uh, also contains UI within it. And it's, by the way, it's not, uh, it's intentional that it's on the complete other side from the developers. For the sake of our discussions, although it's much more than that, we're going to talk about user experience as being the surface of the product or the externals of the product and uh, the product engineering about the internals. But it, it's more than that, but for this session, we, that's, uh, that's sufficient. And of course, we have product management over here, which is comprised of product planning and product marketing. And managing everything is program management, which is essentially like the head that controls the arms and legs of the body. The program management is truly the CEO of the product, and they make sure that all these other functions work together in unison in a coordinated, synchronized fashion to bring a product to market. Now, many companies, because of reasons concerning tradition, budgetary concerns, internal politics, or just plain ignorance, they just don't know. All kinds of responsibilities are taken from different roles and tacked on to product management. So at some companies, they take the program management function and they tack it on to the product management, to the product manager, and then you get that misconception of the product manager, CEO of the product but it's really the program management function. Several years ago, they started also to try to offload the UX, uh, user experience and UI, onto the product management people. So what they did, they started talking about UX product management, but that kind of went away very quickly. But you do still have people at uh, web and startup companies uh, with an orientation to the web, product management people, doing wireframes and things like that, which is a graphic representation of the components of a website. 
In some situations with software companies, especially those who've had a transition to Agile Scrum, the product management people are dragged all the way down into the deep into the development team to serve as a resource over there when the development team starts using Agile Scrum. So this was the methodological overview, but uh, let's uh, move a little bit to the business world, into the reality of things. Let's put the methodology apart, up the side. Uh, for the most part, in many companies, product management is identified primarily with product planning. So let's put product marketing aside for a second, and just flow with that. If this is the case then, then product management is a market focus, not a technology focus and not a product focused activity that's aimed at finding problems in the market, market problems that uh, have money associated with them, that the customers are willing to pay for, and then documenting these problems and communicating those problems in the language that developers understand to the development team so that the developers can offer a solution. So if this is the case, then derived from the definition of product management is the product manager definition which is therefore a market expert, not a product expert because the product expert is the product architect and not a technology expert because that is the lead developer, at least. <coughs> this is a market expert who looks for problems and then communicates them in a language that the developers understand so that the developers can offer a solution. <laughs> so the creed of the focus of a product manager is that they're essentially managing the problem that the product solves. They're not managing the project or the product or the technology or the features or anything like that. And based on all this logic and rationale, we can understand that uh, there was a lot of problems and misconceptions in how people view product management. Now, where does product management belong within the organization? So in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, there was no product management, really. The developers did product planning, and there was a lot of sale, but there wasn't a lot of marketing. And the executives decided that developers are very clever and smart people, but they need guidance, and sometimes they're difficult to work with, so we need an interface between them and the market, and an interface between the developers and other functions within the organization. So they put product management exactly under the engineering team. The minute that that happened, all the developers started to undermine the product manager, saying that he or she does not know technology, and they're not in position even to tell us what to do, and they neutralized the individual. And that took place from the mid-70s to the mid-80s. So by then, the executives realized, you know, product planning, product marketing, there's some kind of a connection there, so they moved product management under marketing. But in many companies, marketing is actually sales and marketing, which means that the sales component is dominant. And then you have the product manager serving as a resource for the salespeople doing demos and helping them with bids and whatever, and as a resource for the marketing people writing copyright for the website and preparing, of course, a lot of sales tools. So from the mid-90s to the mid-2000s, they pushed or moved product management into its own top-level function with a VP of products or a VP of product management or a chief product officer managing this whole thing. And yet again, with software companies in the mid-2000s who had transitioned to agile development methods and to Scrum, the product management people are drawn back to the good old disco days of the 70s under engineering. <coughs> product development, product management, product project, program, all these things are because of misconceptions and misunderstandings and politics and ignorance and whatever that have been tacked on to product management. So just, uh, we're not gonna do a discussion because we have a constraint time, but, but think about it for yourself and we can talk about it perhaps after. Is there a clear division in your particular company between the problem space and solution space with an interface in between? Is there a clear division between product development and product management with an interface in between? It's all kind of mixed up with its advantages and disadvantages. The product management world was thrown into turmoil to chaos at software companies who transi transitioned to Agile Scrum. 
suddenly there was this role deep inside the development team that for some reason a lot of people thought that it has come somehow similar to the product manager role. Essentially what happened to a lot of companies is that they started thinking, do, uh, do these two roles uh, work together? Are they the same? Are they not? Uh, can we cancel one role instead of in favor of the other? Or can one person do both and so forth? So for the most part, for the most part, most companies retain the product, sorry, the Scrum product owner role, and then they did one of two things. Either they abolished completely the product manager role, fired the individual or just canceled the role, or they kept the product manager role, but at the same time told the individual, you're going to be a product manager, and at the same time, you're also going to have product owner responsibilities. How is this possible? How is this possible that the product manager role, which is a classic, critical role, strategic role, deep inside the problem space, is suddenly being undermined and threatened, so to speak, by something that's happening deep inside the development team? In order to understand this, we need to go for a little bit of history. Lightweight software development is essentially a byproduct of heavyweight software development. Heavyweight software development is an approach which is kind of more rigid and process oriented, in which you work in specific blocks in that uh, when you finish one block, you transition to the other. So what you do first, let's say, planning and design and development and test and implementation, and everything kind of rolls to each other. And under heavyweight software development, there are things such as waterfall or stage gate, milestone based, spiral models, and things like that. Lightweight software development immediately came about when heavyweight software development started because it's just a more flexible approach or a more easy way of doing things less, less rigid. Lightweight software development is essentially the same and derived out of heavyweight software development, but it does things in a more iterative and incremental fashion, and there's a lot more kind of flexibility involved with it, but essentially it's the same principles. So lightweight software development has been with us since the 1960s. And it kind of faded and uh, went out of favor for about 30 years. And then in the 90s, it came back again. And during the mid to late 90s, all kinds of people started talking and trying to develop their own type of lightweight software development methods. And things such as extreme programming or crystal clear or feature-driven development, and also something called Scrum came about during the mid-90s to the 2000s. When team, people talk about agility, agile, thought, things like that, there's a lot of confusion, so we're going to try to clear this up once and for all, perhaps. When team, people talk about agility, they're talking about responsiveness, about flexibility, about nimbleness, the ability to kind of uh, have the process more malleable, more and more flexible, that you can make decisions and do things a little bit different, not in a rigid approach. The process will work for you instead of you working for the process. And when people talk about Agile, they could be talking about something called the Manifesto, which is a document we'll talk about soon. They could be really saying we're working Agile, which means we're working lightweight software development. Or they could be saying we're working with Agile as a synonym, synonym to the method being used. The method being used, whether it's uh, Scrum or SAFE or DAD or XP or anything like that, is what's going to determine your ability to reach agility and to actually achieve the values associated with lightweight software development. So Scrum became popular. Scrum became the most popular type of Agile software development. Let's try to understand why Scrum became so popular. Companies are always trying to drive forward their software development methods and efforts to reduce money, to reduce time, to make more, and so forth. And during the late 1990s, there was the collapse of the dot-com period, and then there was an ensuing three-year <coughs> session of a high-tech recession in the United States. And there was a lot of software being developed and a lot of web activities being done over there during that time. And everybody was reeling from that bad situation, and they lost a lot of money, and they were looking for a faster, better way of doing things in software development. And like with software development, kind of came back as an idea of how to deliver software faster. 
There's also a timing perspective over here with regard to the Agile world and Scrum. And the Agile Manifesto, which we'll talk about in a second, and the Scrum book, both came, at two th came out at 2001, which in timing it's perfect because it's smack right in the middle between the kind of collapse of the dot-com and the beginning of the high-tech sector uh, recession. So the Agile Manifesto is a proclamation document, a very simple uh, proclamation docu document that was written by several individuals and developers who convened in Utah in 2001. And their whole full process and idea was to find a way for doing better custom software development. But during the 80s and the 90s, it was very customary for companies to do uh, custom software development to hire a consultant and ask that consultant to build that application for them. And when you do that, you kind of outline a feature scope, and then you uh, negotiate the timeline, and you negotiate the price, and you lock everything into a contract. And then when you add a feature, then you need to open the contract, and open the time, and open the time schedule, and the scope, and everything, and ask for more money. And that's not nice. So what they decided to do was they wanted to find a more flexible, easy way of doing things. And they started to consider lightweight software development as a way of doing it. All the values of communication, collaboration, uh, discovery, experimentation, whatever, inside the manifesto are things that have been with us for decades. So there's really nothing new over here. But the point is that the Agile Manifesto was not for commercial software, it was, it was for custom software development. So this was, of course, published in 2001, as that's critical in terms of timing. Now, the manifesto was written by several individuals, and two individuals from the manifesto, Ken Schwaber and Jeff Sutherland, yeah, they had, before the manifesto, developed uh, the Scrum software development method. In 2001, yet again, exactly at that time period, Ken Schwaber and Mike Beadle, who was also another guy who was working on the manifesto, published a book called Agile Software Development with Scrum. So those of you who can already see the chain of associations over here. What we have is the Agile Manifesto is based on lightweight software development. And therefore, if you start talking about something called Agile software development, then that is also synonymous with lightweight software development. And then when you publish the book, Agile Software Development with Scrum, then you have a complete association between all these terms. And this is what happened. People started to associate Agile, Agility, and Scrum as being all the same, intertwined, interchangeable, and so forth. So a lot of the success of Scrum is based on circumstance and happenstance, the timing of things. There's other reasons, of course, why Scrum became uh, successful, also the simplicity, but uh, it became the number one uh, adaptation of the Agile methods that uh, companies uh, use, and over 70% of Agile adoptions were Scrum. So let's talk a little bit about the Scrum method itself. Scrum is essentially built on American sports culture. It does a lot of relabeling, and another fundamental is generalization. There's a lot of cosmetics here involved. So let's go over this. Those of you in Amer who know American football know that the objective of the, key the team in American football is to advance towards the end goal of the rival in a series of steps which are called downs. So similar to American football, in Scrum it's called sprints. There's one person uh, in the football team who's managing the plays and coordinating each time they do a down. Over there it's called the quarterback, over here it's called the product owner. There's somebody on the sidelines who understands the master plan and, uh, and makes sure that everybody's playing by the rules and so forth. Over there it's called the coach and scrum, it is called the scrum master. And they have all these standing sessions where they kind of uh, talk to each other and they say what they're going to do and whatever. Over there it's called the team huddle, over here it's called the ceremonies. Scrum also does a lot of relabeling. Scrum takes things that we have known for decades and just changes the, sh the name. Not, nothing more than that. For example, documents are now called artifacts. Meetings are now called ceremonies. <laughs> Managing documents is grooming documents. And lastly, of course, postmortems is um, called retrospectives. Nothing improved, nothing really new. Scrum does a lot of generalization. Scrum takes all the documents that we had and aggregates them into something which is called the backlog. 
Scrum also takes all the developers with their levels of specialization and seniority and just makes them homogeneous kind of the same thing, a cookie cutter type of developer. And Scrum also takes a variety of roles that are not officially recognized under Scrum and aggregates them into one individual called the product owner. Essentially, the Scrum product owner is what we've known for decades as a software development project manager, but it's just relabeled and generalized. But because there's a variety of different roles not recognized under Scrum, then those responsibilities, yet again, in the same fashion, are tacked on to the product manager. Scrum uses something which is called the backlog. And according to Schwaber and Sutherland, this is a verbatim quote from their book, the product backlog is an order list of everything. Everything. So it invalidates every other document, officially at least. And it's the single source of requirements, which means that if you want to write market requirements, product requirements, technical requirements, it all goes into the backlog. So the backlog is a repository of everything. The work, the bugs, the actions, uh, buy a pizza, go to here, whatever. Everything goes into the backlog. So, a little bit of a sophistication over here. The backlog is an ordered list of PBIs, product backlog items. But they don't tell you what a PBI is or what it represents. When I first saw this, I realized this is just a white piece of paper. There's nothing here. There's not a method here. So there's a void over here, a chaos, and somebody has to step in. And the gentleman by the name of Mike Cohen in 2001 from a company called Mountain Goat Software realized that you need to list something. And the reality between requirements and, and um, uh, technical specifications are features. And features can be easily represented by use cases. But a use case, that's so 70s, 80s, whatever, we need to relabel and do things with it. So he took the use case and decoupled it into components. One part he called it easy user story, the other part he called it acceptance criteria. And that became the most popular type of PBI used by people. But for the most part, if we take these two components and put them together, we get the classical use case again. So the product owner role is a managerial role who's responsible for the product backlog, okay? But if the product backlog contains everything, <laughs> then by reverse logic, you could say that the product owner is responsible for everything. And this is a good diagram by Roman Pickler, who's actually, I think, with us here in the audience, in which he outlines, according to Scrum, the product owner role. This reminds me of one of those American TV shows where the legal shows where the judge says, I know this is wrong, but it's perfectly legal. So this is exactly what we have over here. Under Scrum, all the other roles that have been not officially recognized, somebody has to do their responsibilities. So this is tacked on to the product owner role. But really the product owner is just a project manager and that is the core focus. Doing everything like this is unfeasible in my mind. So Scrum is very simple. And simplicity is important because some Scrum is so simple that in one day with lunch you can learn it and be certified. But a Scrum, a Scrum is simple and you need simplicity in order to uh, get to more fa uh, speed on things. But you lose responsiveness and you lose the ability to scale. In addition to that, Scrum is using bad language. The people who wrote uh, the Scrum books and everything they wrote colloquial language, and it's very unclear, and there's constant uh, attempts to interpret things. And also, Scrum does not describe things in a complete fashion. It's incomplete. There's a lot of answers unanswered over there. And um, essentially, there are a lot of holes in Scrum, more than even in Swiss cheese. But because there's, Scrum is unclear and incomplete, Somebody has to step in with an interpretation if you want to use it and fill those holes. And that gave rise to an army of consultants, mentors, coaches, trainers, and whatever, whose job is to explain to us what the gods of Agile and Scrum wanted. Just like rabbis and priests explain to you what's in the Bible, they provide their own interpretation filling the holes within Scrum. How does this come about, really? There's a kind of a power play over here, and especially in technology and sales-driven companies, the 
dominant function, politically and otherwise, are the engineers. And they view themselves as the core of the company, and everybody else around them is there to serve them. It's kind of a mission where everybody needs to conform to them. And in those kind of companies, product management is supposed to conform to whatever's happening on the other side of the fence. If they work waterfall, we'll do whatever you want. If they sort of decide to move to Scrum or Kanban or Safe or Dad or Less or whatever, everybody has to alter their way and change according to them. And this is common with some technical people. And Schwab and Solomon were technical people. And it wasn't a problem for them to say, we're going to walk and take somebody from a completely different department and take them into our department and make them a resource for our needs, for something that we developers really don't want to do, manage things. So this is verbatim from 2012 from the Schreiber and Sutherland Scrum book. And they say officially, product managers and customers. The customers is because of the custom software development part. The product managers is for the commercial software part. Are going to be retrained. It says product owner training. We're going to retrain them and make them product owners. And just as an example of the kind of language that they used over there, which is co colloquial, they say the product owner is going to do this and avoid surprises. What does it mean to avoid surprises? You mean scope creep or undue bugs or too much? I actually like uh, surprises, especially the good kind. <laughs> So, until 2012, people always interpreted uh, the product manager as a scrum product owner, yes, no, yes, no, in my opinion, in my first, my previous workplace and whatever, and like that. And it was all conjecture and opinion and things like that. But now, in 2012, in their book, officially from God, it came, product managers are going to be retrained, officially, they're going to be retrained to become product owners. And that immediately created a domino effect in which product managers were forced to undertake product, uh, scrum product ownership responsibilities in the development team. That creates, again, by reverse logic, if the product manager is doing agile scrum, then agile scrum is a form of product management. And that immediately created a notion that there is something called Agile product management, but it doesn't make sense because Agile is a software development method and product management is strategic in the problem space. So yet again, we got from that also the term Agile product management and the road was very quick to coining Agile product manager, which is just a euphemism for the Scrum product owner. Scrum did not deliver the results it promised. When you talk to some people, they're like zombies. With Scrum, you get a prototype in three months, it's waterfall, you get it in here. I think it's a lot like politics that they blame this boogeyman called waterfall while the entire world around us is built by waterfall. And saying, you know, politicians, they, they frighten you and then say, we'll save you. But come to us, waterfall, just don't go there. But in any case, in any case, Scrum did not deliver the results it promised. And here we have Ken Schwaber in 2008 saying that 75% of those trying to apply Scrum are not going to get the results promised and it's not going to work. And Jeff Sutherland in Agile Walls in 2013 in Berlin says 50% are not going to get the results. Now, this is coming from the people who wrote and founded this method, method of doing things. So imagine, uh, by the way, the reality is that uh, something around 85% of, of uh, Scrum adoptions are failing, but it depends on who you believe in terms of the resource and how you define failure. In any case, just imagine, imagine a, a, a lawyer or anybody who would tell you, four out of, three out of four times I'm wrong. Or imagine a developer that he says, three out of four lines of code that I write have bugs. Or imagine a doctor that says, three out of four times I'm wrong, and a car that three out of four times doesn't start. It doesn't make sense. So let's use a food recipe as an analogy. Imagine that there's a food recipe circulating the world, and everywhere, you, everywhere it's failing. It's not working out. People don't like it. And the people who created the recipe, they say, it's the practitioners and the chef and the kitchen help and the ingredients and the environment and the country and the culture and whatever, and it's you. 
But eventually people realize that if it's failing all over the world, then probably there's something wrong with the recipe itself. The method is wrong. But the executives don't care anymore. They don't care if the, it's the practitioners or the consultants or the method or whatever. They gotta run a business. And that has created a dynamic in the market for a new breed of agile method with the purpose of transitioning out of Scrum. So there's all kinds of new ways coming about. You hear about Scrumful and Flexible Waterfall and Safe and Dead and all kinds of uh, rational unif unified process with flexibility involved with it and things like that. All these methods are trying to clarify things that were not clarified in Scrum, such as the interfaces between the teams, the roles, the documents, the responsibilities. They're trying to bring clarity and fill all those gaps that were under Scrum. Essentially, you can see over here with SAFE, and it's just an example, they all bring back all the functions that are not recognized under Scrum. <coughs> product management, product architecture, things like that. Everything is coming back. Essentially, if we look at it from a kind of uh, foundational perspective, a methodology perspective, all these types of new breed of agile methods are going to confine themselves into the solution space. They're not going to try also to manip manipulate or monopolize areas in the problem space. They level information. No more that big salad backlog thing that everything falls inside and you can't differentiate, differentiate the, the work, the problem, the solution, the bugs, whatever. They bring back role specialization and not role generalization and they define clear interfaces between product development and the other teams, particularly user experience and product management. With regard to the product manager, all these new methods recognize the product manager as a distinct role, strategic role, in the problem space, while we developers are in the solution space. Henry Louis Mencken was an author and a journalist in the United States, and he said that for every complex problem, there's an answer that's simple, clear, simple, and wrong. Scrum was that clear, simple, and wrong answer that people wanted in order to deliver, fast, uh, to f deliver software in a faster way. This agile Scrum experiment, which has been with us for about a decade, has done a lot of damage, and I think there will be books written about that. It completely messed up people's perception with regard to what product management is. When you talk to people about what product management is at software companies, they immediately bring an opinion. There's no methodological foundation, there's no rationale, there's no supporting <coughs> argument. In my opinion, the earth is flat and the moon is made of cheese and let's have a discussion. And let's vote and whoever gets most votes is going to be right. It messed up completely people's perception of what is product management. It had negative impact on people's career. People were fired, forced to transition, to work with the development team and things like that. It disrupted the relationship between the different departments. And in a business sense, it failed to deliver the results. In the long term, the damage for companies is that they had depleted their resources in product management and their practices in product management. And now when they're transitioning out of Scrum, they're trying to rebuild all those competencies and the knowledge that they had lost, that they had lost when they had uh, moved to Scrum. The product manager and the product owner role were never the same. From every type of rationale or argument that you can make, it never, never was the same. Scrum is a fundamentally flawed software development method and cannot be reformed because of its principles. And that's why they're not fixing it, they're transitioning to something else. Product manager is a strategic role in the problem space. Product owner is a project operational role in the solution space. One is about the market problem, the user and the buyer. One is about driving the development effort. One is a project oriented approach, one is a strategic. It's just very different. So, are there any questions at this point? I think everything's clear. Are you shocked or something? Uh, yeah, I, I will start from here.